Hi guys, and welcome to the fourth video in this series on making a 3D Endless Runner in Unity. In this video, we'll be adding coins, spawning a random number in at random positions on each tile, adding to the player's score whenever they collect one, and displaying the score on the screen for the player to see. Before we get started, don't forget to hit like and subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss another video. Without further ado, let's get started. The first thing I'm going to do is right click in the hierarchy and create a new cylinder, so 3D object cylinder, and I'll click F2 to rename it and call it coin. I'll set its scale on the X and Z to 0 0.7 and on the Y to 0 0.05 to make its shape more like a coin. Then it's rotation on the X to negative 90 to make it stand up. Next, I'll create a new material. So in the materials folder, right click, create material, and I'll call it coin underscore map, short for material. I'll set its color to yellow. and then apply it to the coin by dragging and dropping it on. Finally, I'll select the coin and find its collider. So that will be a capsule collider. In the collider, I'll check the is trigger box. This means that the player will still be able to interact with the coin, but won't actually collide and have its direction changed when it touches one. Next, let's create a new script. So in the scripts folder, I'll right click, create, C sharp script, and I'll call this coin. Give it a moment to compile, and then double click to open it up in Visual Studios. In here, we simply want to detect when the player runs into the coin. So let's create a new function. So void on trigger enter. This is the default function called when an object interacts with a trigger. And remember that we set this coin's collider to be a trigger. In here, we need to first check that, check that the object we collided with is the player. And then we need to add to the player's score. And finally, we need to destroy this coin. To check that the other object was the player, let's type if and then other to access the other game object. You can see it's the input over here. So other dot game object dot name is not equal to and then player. Now you'll notice that we're checking whether the item is not the player, not that the item is the player. And what we're going to do is type return in here. This means if the object is not the player, we will stop executing the rest of the function. To destroy the game object, we simply have to type destroy and then game object with a lowercase g to signify that it's this game object that we're talking about. Destroy destroys the object and game object is a reference to this game object. Something I believe would be quite a nice visual effect would be to have the coin rotate. To do this, let's add a new public variable at the top. So public, it will be type of float, and I'll say turn speed. By default, I'll set this value to 90, meaning that it will rotate 90 degrees every second. In the update function, remember this is called every frame, I'll say transform dot rotate. 0, 0, turn speed, times, time, dot, delta, time. This will rotate the coin along its z-axis by 90 degrees every second. Time dot delta time is the amount of time passed between the last frame and this frame, and as update is called every frame, this ensures that the coin will always rotate 90 degrees every second, regardless of the frame rate. With that done, we can now return back to the editor. The first thing I'll do is select our coin object and drag and drop the coin script we just made onto it. 
Next, I'll set its transform position to 0, 0, and 0, and then go to our prefabs folder and drag and drop it in to turn it into a prefab. Finally, I'll delete the coin from the scene. Now we need to spawn the coins. To do this, we're going to go to our grand tile script, then scroll to the bottom, and we'll need a new public variable, type of game object, and I'll call this the coin prefab. Next, I'll create a function, so this will be void spawn coins. It will not take any input. And inside it, we need an integer for how many coins we want to spawn. I'll call this coins to spawn. For now, I'll just set it equal to 10. Next, I'll type 4, then hit tab twice to insert the snippet. And the only thing I'll change in here is from length to coins to spawn. This will run any code in here 10 times. In here, we first want to spawn a coin then set its position to a random position on the tile. Spawning the coin is simple, we just have to say instantiate, and then coin prefab. You'll remember that instantiate is Unity's fancy way of saying spawn. Now we need to get a reference to the coin that we just spawned, so that we can change its position later. To do this, in front of the instantiate, I'll add game object temp, short for temporary is equal to the instantiated object. This saves the object we spawn in a variable called temp. To get the random position, I'll create a new function. This is going to be a little more complicated, so just follow along with me and I'll explain it all at the end. This function will return a 3D position, which is called a vector3 in Unity. So type vector3, and then I'll call this function get random point in collider. This will take an input type of collider and I'll call this collider with a lowercase c. And finally open and close some curly braces. To get this position we're going to use what's called the collider bounds. This is essentially how far the collider reaches. The collider's minimum bounds is how far left it goes, where my mouse is over here, and its maximum bound on the x is how far right it goes. Minimum z is how far back it goes, and maximum z is how far forward it goes. Similarly, minimum y is how far down it goes, and maximum y is how far up it goes. Essentially what we're going to do is create a new vector 3, which will ask for an x, y, and z value. These values are going to be a random number between the minimum and maximum values of each axis of the collider, which will ensure that we get a point on the ground tile. In code, we would write this as vector3 point to declare a new variable type of vector3, which remember is just a position, and I'll set this equal to new vector3, and if I open some parentheses, you'll see that it asks for an x, y, and z value. To make it easier to read, I'll separate these onto their own lines. So for the x value, we're going to say random.range to get a random number within a range, and this will be collider.bounds.min.x. Remember, this is how far left it goes, and collider dot bounds dot max dot x. Remember, this is how far right it goes. I'll put a comma to say that we are now inputting the y position. Then I'll copy and paste the line that we just used for x, but replace x with y. Finally, I'll do the same thing for z. At the end, I have to remove this comma, as we are not inputting any more values after this. At the end of declaring this vector3 point variable, we're going to need to put a semicolon to indicate that this is the end of a line. Remember, we could have easily written it like this, all in one, all in one line, but I decided that it would be easier to read if we had separated them out, so I'll leave it like that. 
the last confusing thing that we're going to have to do is say if the point is not in collider dot closest point and then point inside this if statement i'll say point is equal to get random point in collider collider you don't really need to worry about what this does as it shouldn't ever be called but it simply checks whether the random point that we generated is on the collider and if it isn't it will generate a new value for the point that is on the collider this should never be called because we are only taking values from within the collider in the first place as you saw up here but it's a good precaution in case there's some computing error if this whole function makes no sense to you, don't worry, as I promised you'll understand it after using Unity for just a bit longer. Just ignore it, and let's continue with writing the rest of the code. After the if statement, let's say point dot y is equal to 1. Remember, y is the up axis. This will ensure that the coins all spawn at the same height. And finally, I'll return point. We can't simply say return in this case, as we had declared up the top that this function should return a vector 3 or a position. Let's forget about that function now, and back in the spawn coins function, we'll say temp.transform to get the transform component. Remember, this holds the position, rotation, and scale, so we'll say dot .position to get its position, and then we'll set this equal to get random point in collider. And for the collider, we'll say get component in the angular brackets collider and finish off with parentheses. What we are doing here is setting the position of the coin that we just spawned equal to a random point in the ground tiles collider. If I go back to the editor, I'm in the ground tile here. If I select the ground tile, the green outline is the collider, and you can see that this only extends as far as the ground does. This means that the coins will always be spawned within the ground where the player can reach them, and never just out in empty space, for example somewhere over here. Back in the script, in the start function of the ground tile, I'll call the function that we just made, so spawn coins. Now we should be able to test it. So if we save our script and go back to the editor, in the inspector, make sure you assign the coin to the coin prefab variable. And now we should be able to hit play. The coins are spawning now, that's great. And we can also collect them, but nothing happens when we collect them. Additionally, if I pause the game by hitting shift control P and then go back to the scene view, you will see that all of the coins behind the player aren't being destroyed. Currently this isn't an issue, but if someone managed to play this game for a long time, we might end up with millions of objects in the scene, which might create lag in the gameplay. This is a simple fix, so let's go back to the ground tile script and wait. This is a simple fix, so let's go back to the ground tile script and in the spawn coins function. I'll simply add transform as a second argument to the instantiate. You can see that transform refers to the parent, meaning that the coins will be parented to the ground tile, and therefore when the ground tile is destroyed, the coins will also be destroyed along with it. To prove this, let's go back to the editor and hit play. You can see in the scene view over here that there are no coins being left behind the player. Great. If I unpause the game and keep playing, I'm just looking for an issue that I'm having here. You can see that some coins are being spawned inside obstacles, making them impossible to reach. To fix this, let's exit play mode and then go back to the coin script. In the onTrigger enter function, at the very top, I'm going to add if the other dot game object dot get component obstacle is not equal to null and inside that oops sorry and inside that I'll say destroy 
game object and then return. What this does is check if the other game object is an obstacle because only obstacles will contain the component obstacle which refers to the script that we made for the obstacle if you remember. And if it is an obstacle, it will destroy itself and stop executing the script. But if we go back to the editor and test it, you will see that this is not working. This coin in the bottom right of the screen here is currently intersecting an obstacle. If you cast your mind back to the first tutorial we did, you will remember that for collisions to work, at least one of the objects requires a rigid body component. So to fix this, I'll simply double click on the coin prefab to open it up and scroll to the bottom and add a rigid body component. In here, I'll check is kinematic, which simply means to ignore regular physics such as gravity, which we don't want. Now we should be able to test it out and see that it's all working. You can see that there's no coins spawning inside obstacles anywhere. That's great. The last thing we're going to do today is keep track of the player's score. To do this, let's go to the scripts folder, right click, and create a new C -sharp script, and I'll call this the game manager. Give it a moment to compile, and then double click to open it up in Visual Studio. In here, we're going to need a variable, type of int, and called score. We're also going to need a public static variable, type of game manager, called inst. Create a new function called awake. This function is called at the very start of the game, even before the start function, and inside it, I'll type inst is equal to this. This is definitely not a beginner topic, so don't concern yourself with what this does, but it's the quickest way to achieve what we want, which is why I decided to go with it. If you want to research it, this is called a singleton, but I won't explain it in this video, as I want to keep it simple. If you can't be bothered researching it, but want to know more, drop a comment below and I'll try to explain it as simply as I can. What this allows us to do is go to the coin script, and now to add to the player's score, we can simply say game manager dot inst dot score plus plus. However, you will see that we are getting an error here, and it says that the score variable is inaccessible due to its protection level. What this means is that we did not set it to be public, so the coin script is not allowed to access it. To fix this, I'll simply add public in front of the score variable. Now every time the player collects a coin, the score should increase. Plus plus is a quick way of saying add 1 to the variable score. Now in the editor, I'm going to exit out of the coin prefab and create a new empty game object, which I'll call game manager. I'll add the game manager script to it. And you can see the score variable here, so as we collect coins, you should see that increase. I'll also right click and go UI text. I'll call this the score text. In the inspector, I'll set its text to say score colon zero. I'll also set its font size to 25. Next, I'll click on the icon in the top left hand corner and select the top left one. This means that its position will be relative to the top left of the screen. If I select the 2D view in the scene and scroll out, you can see that this cross icon is in the top left. This represents the anchor of the object, so if I changed it to top right, you can see that it moves wherever I put it. I'm going to leave that in the top left. And then I'll set its position on the x to 90, on the y to negative 25. You can see that it looks much better in our game view now. Next, I'll click on the main camera and change the background from a skybox to a solid color. I'll click on the background and choose a light blue color, but remember, you can use any color you want. 
this looks much better. Finally, back in the game manager script, we need to change the text on the screen when the score changes. To do this, we're going to need to add a new using tag at the top. So under using Unity Engine, I'll add using Unity Engine dot UI. This allows us to access and edit text elements. With this done, we can now add a new public variable type of text, and I'll call it score text. Let's also add a new public function. So I'll say public void increment score open and close parentheses and then a pair of curly braces in here we'll say score plus plus remember this simply adds one to the score and then score text dot text to access the text component of this object is equal to score colon this is in quotation marks and then out of the quotation marks i'll say plus score this sets the text of the text element to score followed by our current score. The very last thing we need to do in code is go to the coin script and change the game manager.inst.score plus plus to game manager.inst.increment score. So instead of directly adding to the score, we'll simply call this function, which adds to the score and also sets the UI. Now we can finally go back to the editor, and in the game manager, we'll assign the score text to the score text variable. I'm going to hover over the game view and hit shift space to maximize it, then start the game. You can see the score text in the top left corner increasing every time we collect a coin. That's great. Also, if we hit an obstacle and die, when the game restarts, our score will be reset to zero. If you couldn't understand everything that was happening in this video, please don't worry about it, as I wanted to give you some ideas of what you can do with Unity, some of which we had to go past the beginner level to achieve. If you want to learn more about anything in particular that I did, please drop a comment and I promise I'll answer it to the best of my ability. That's the end of this tutorial. In the next one, we'll look at adding some finishing touches to the game. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.